Dad, I'll let you bring in your man, Leon Douglas. Well, Anderson. Leon Douglas was one of the great players in the history of Alabama basketball. He was uh, he made it hard on us to get him, but he, he was worth it. It was work, worth all the hard work. He, he's pretty tricky, but uh, what a player he was. Good morning, Leon. How you doing? Good, and you? Oh, we're okay. <laughs> um, I want to ask you this. I, 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 I think you can help me a little bit. Kyle Lewis and John Petty are going to go pro or, or go and put their name in the pot. When you got through, you went to Detroit. Tell our listeners kind of how it worked for you. Well, you know, see, I had an opportunity, Coach, to leave when I was a sophomore. And, okay. Uh, you know, my situation was, you know, I put education first. Right. And, uh, you know, and I wanted to go, but my mother had other ideas, so therefore <laughs> I listened to her. But the type of money they're paying now, you know, a lot of these kids are sort of, Looking at <clears throat> looking at it from that perspective, because yeah. uh, if you're a lot of the pick, that means you you're set for life. And back when I came out, you know the money wasn't as great as it is now, but yet and still, it's sort of based on what your priorities are. Right. And uh, you know a lot of guys don't go to school for an education anymore. They go to school just to uh, put themselves in a better drafting position. And uh, when that position comes up, you know, they sort of go out there. And uh, and now with only two rounds, you know, it's sort of interesting that, you know, people will put their names in the draft. But, you know, you've you got European basketball, you got basketball in Australia, you got basketball in China, Japan, and you got basketball all over the world where they're paying, you know, enormous amount of money. So... A lot of times, you know, when guys put their legs in the draft, they're not only looking at the NBA, they're looking at the European situation as well. Yeah. And you uh, didn't you didn't really look uh you didn't really think about it after your sophomore year, did you? I mean you thought about it but it kinda of <laughs> just your, your mother wouldn't let you think about it, would you? Well, Coach, I thought about it my junior year. <laughs> and that's one reason why I, you know, I worked to try to graduate. You know, yeah. I made going to school a year round project. Sure. So that when you know when I was a senior, that I would be able to graduate and get out of there and pursue my dream. But see, that wasn't my dream when I started college. Sure. You know, my dream was to uh, be able to uh, pay for my education and someone else put the bill. You know, not my right. mom have to uh, put the bill. So, you know, my objective was somewhat different. Then you know these young men now. You know they're going to school to try to get a, a contract, and I was going to school trying to get an education because the you know the, the timing and the situation was totally different in the seventies. Because in the seventies, you know, immigration had just started, and uh, getting an education was top priority. Yeah. Well, that's that's true. That's that's good stuff right there, Barry. Uh, you end up uh, being, I guess, the fourth pick uh, in the. First round to the Detroit Pistons. Uh, I don't know if you mind answering this question. I'm just curious. When you signed your first contract, what was your first contract? What was it worth uh, back in the seventies compared to what it is t- today? Uh, well, you know, my first contract, you know, I made like three hundred a year. Really? Yeah. You know, and it wasn't close to what it is now. You know, and see, I was the fourth pick. Yeah. And and I had the uh, opportunity to be the first pick, but I wouldn't sign before the you know before the draft. And see, back then they would most teams would contact you and say, if you sign before the draft, you know we'll draft you in this position. Right. And uh, Jerry Krause, uh, uh, I would well, I would have been the second pick for Chicago had I signed before the draft because. Uh, Jerry Krause came down. He spent a lot of time with me. He told me if I would just go ahead and commit. The time because at that particular time, you still had the ABA. They were still uh, in business. And right after the beginning of that season in 1976, the ABA folded and they merged with the NBA. And so that took leverage away from uh, all of the guys that came out in 76. 
we didn't have that two league leverage. Uh, 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 right there, uh, Leon. Today, as you the the game's changed so much. You guys were low post players. You played through the low post. Now, uh, post guys, and, and it probably goes back to the AAU. Now, all the post guys want to be on the perimeter. Uh, nobody plays down low. I know watching Alabama this year, very rarely did they ever even throw the ball uh, to the post. Uh, how much has the game changed uh, back from when you guys used to play? I think it was it was better uh, back then, to be quite honest with you. Well, it's, it's changed completely. But if you think about it, the number one team in the nation this year was Kansas. Right. Yeah. And, if I, and if we both look back, Kansas had a 7-3 guy in the post and a 6-11 guy had the power forward. Right. Yeah. So DSF didn't change. No, he didn't. Uh, I guess, okay. but it's just not as many out there to go recruit because all these guys now, everybody's telling me you got to play on the perimeter. So low post guys are a dime a dozen now. It seems like, in, in my opinion. But you got to teach, Barry. You know, right. folks will tell you this. You know, you've got to uh, find a guy that can fit that role, and you've got to teach him what he needs to do. So most of the guys now. Uh, hey, you guys that get their hands on these guys when they're young. Yeah. And, you know, and they have that, what I call that Michael Jordan rule. Everybody want to be like Mike and play on the perimeter and put up shots and, you know, and have great ball handling skills. And that's all the way up. That's good. But yet and still, if you got an aircraft carrier like Mark, like Coach McGuire used to say, if you got an aircraft carrier and you got them down there on the block, that changes the game completely because one thing about it, you can play offense all day, but then again, you got to play defense as well. And, you know, your father, coach, was an offensive guy when I was in Alabama. Whenever we had a problem offensively, we would always look at coach and say, you know, you need to give us something. And Barry, he would drop that towel <laughs> and start writing up something, and when we went back on the court, he had given us what we needed offensively. Right. But if I recall, when he became the head coach at Alabama, he became a defensive coach because he understands that defense is really the key to whether you win or lose because you can score all the points you want, but at the end of the day, you got to stop somebody. Uh, you, that's and, uh, somebody you recruit offensive guys and you coach defense and you make them you make them defend. I think they probably he probably figured that out, didn't he, Leon? Yeah, he figured it out quick because. He was he probably one of the greatest coaches ever at the University of Alabama, and it wasn't because he was an offensive genius. You know, he was a, he was an all around coach, but he stressed defense, and I think that's really why people need to recreate that inside presence. Because if you got a big man and he can and he plays defense well, if you feed him every now and then on the block, you know that makes him play harder, yeah. and. Uh, you know, I know it looks good with the threes, but when the threes don't fall, what happens? Yeah, get beat. You, you've got problems. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, go ahead, does, does, uh, I guess the first round is guaranteed money, and the second round is not guaranteed. Is, is that? Of course, that's a major difference. But is that is that the deal? That's the deal, coach. Uh, the first round was, you know, the second round, they signed you to a contract. Okay. And they, they have the uh, the power to either guarantee the money or make it a, you know, non-guaranteed contract. And baseball and basketball are, t- are the two only leagues that whatever contract you sign in the first round is always a guaranteed contract. So the moment you sign... The only way you don't get that money is that you choke on a chicken bone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the D League, the D League is such, Leon, that it, it makes people, kids that uh, think about think about a little bit of money being a lot of money, and they're liable to go to the D League just not be really not being ready because they need a little money. Is is, is the D D League uh, effective or not? Or do you know? <laughs> Well, Coach, you know, they changed it from the D-League to the G-League. Yes, the yeah, G-League. that's right, yeah. Yes, yeah, the G-League now. And, uh, you know, it, it's effective because a lot of guys don't want to go overseas. And so if you don't want to go overseas and play internationally, 
you were signed their G League contracts. And I think this year they sort of raised the uh, the amount. I think it's like seventy five thousand a year that you can make playing in the G League. And, uh, and a lot of guys, a lot of young guys, uh, you know, they're going to Europe or Australia because you know they're able to get anywhere between five hundred thousand um, a million per year by going to those different leagues. So a lot of guys don't want to play in the G League because their objective is to make money. Uh, yeah, talk about your time. I think you, I'm looking here uh, at your career playing. It seemed like you spent about 10 years overseas. I don't know that guys will go as much now with this virus till this whole thing clears up. Uh, guys won't, won't, be, won't be wanting to go over there as much. But uh, how was your experience overseas? You must have liked it because you did it for 10 years. Well, you know, once I got over, I had a chance to come back after my first year in Europe. But uh, when you're playing only one game a week, and you're able to uh, travel throughout Europe the remaining part of the week, you only practice like about an hour 15 to an hour and a half a day. You know, it's, it's different. You know, back when we was playing in the league, we played like four games in five nights, three games in four nights. And uh, we didn't have the private jets like the young guys have now. You know, we travel commercial. And so we were getting up at the crack of dawn, getting on a plane, trying to get from point A to point B. And we were tired most of the time we were playing. And if you remember, the games were tape delayed. They was not uh, live. You know, we would play at 11 o'clock in the morning, and they would take the game to replay the game at 7 in the evening. So... It was totally different, but when cable, you know, when cable TV became involved, that changed the whole dynamics of it. And now, you know, people just, you know, they they play, get on the plane, go from point A to point B, and then they play again. But for me, Europe was like a, a vacation. It was a paid vacation, and uh, and once I got there, and I saw that I could probably play for. Uh, 10 or 15 years without a problem, I decided to stay in Europe. And also, you know, I became a coach while I was there. I became a coach and I was assistant general manager. And, uh, you know, I was sort of preparing myself for my career after playing basketball because I, back then I wanted to coach. But also I wanted to be able to understand the uh, administrative side of doing things, and uh, I had an opportunity to learn all that while I was in Europe. Right, Dad. Uh, we we talked a little bit about this last time, but I'm going to talk about it again. Uh, the game against uh, Indiana in Baton Rouge uh, was a game you know he could have, should have, not maybe should have, could have won that game, which was a huge, huge game, maybe one of the bigger games there in the history of Alabama basketball. Um. Certainly, a foul call by an official who was a Big Ten official that uh, they dug stop that now. But uh, I don't know if you want to make any comments about the game, but uh, it, it, it was something you never forget. Well, it was interesting because, you know, we had played all year with that objective. And I think, you know, Coach would attest to this, even when he was coaching at Alabama. Every year we we went out with the objection uh, with uh, with the idea that uh, we wanted to win a national championship. Sure, and that was our goal. We that was our goal at the start of each season. Our goal was not to just win the SEC championship because once we won our first one, my sophomore year, you know, we sort of changed that goal. We wanted to to be one of the elite teams in the country, and in order to be an elite team, you had to compete for a national championship. And myself, T.R., and all the other guys, we, we all talked about that. Talked about, you know, being the last team standing. Sure. And that was, the, that was the biggest thing about that game was that we thought that we had an opportunity to do that because, we you know, we sort of considered ourselves on the same level as football when I was in Alabama. We didn't sure. look at Alabama. We didn't think of Alabama as a football school. We thought of it as a a basketball school as well. And so our goal was to try to compete and win a national championship. And uh, and with that group of guys, because Barry and Coach, one thing, and I think Coach would uh, 
agree with this. We were a family. We had one, you know, we were one beat. Whenever yeah. we played, there was no selfishness. I did not start a game with the idea I needed to score 30 points, 40 points. I put up a lot of shots. The goal was to win the game. And so we thought we had an opportunity to be there now, especially after we beat North Carolina as easily as we did. We thought for sure that, 16. you know, we had a good chance. <laughs> Being 16 in Dayton. Yeah. So yep. we thought we had a chance to uh, pull it off. And uh, I remember that official name was Booker. Yeah. Because yeah. every time I go to the Final Four, someone always mentioned that we had a, had another official instead of one of Bobby Knight's friends that was That's officiating right. the game. You know, we would have probably won the game. I'm saying right now, you're exactly right. That was a, that was a difference in ball game. Yeah. It really was. It, it probably still eats him up to this day, Leon. There's certain games that he will never forget, and that's one of them. That one in Loy- that one in Loyola Marymount. He don't get him talking about those. You'll have him depressed uh, today. Uh, well, Leon, well, tell everybody before we let you go. Tell everybody what you're doing now. Well, currently I'm in uh, Walker County. You know that's you know the interesting battle. I walk around and the first name I hear whenever I go in the gym is Wimp Sanders. <laughs> and, and then I asked, well, "What's Wimp got to do with this?" <laughs> and uh, you know, you know, your dad started his career at Carbon Hill, yeah, which is uh, well, which is in Walker County, yeah. And uh, you know, he's got a legacy up here. You know, they love him. They they still love him. You know, it's been ages since he's coached up here. But you know, he left he left a great name up here. So I'm enjoying Walker County. Matter of fact, the uh, vibe is just not. That's heavy up here for some reason. I guess it's because of all the trees. But, you know, I'm enjoying this. You know, it reminds me a lot of my hometown. And also, I'm I'm teaching again. And that's something that I sort of gotten away from. My latter years in uh, collegiate basketball was that, you know, I wasn't teaching fundamentals as well as I did when I initially started. So what has happened is... I've sort of gone back to the roots of uh, the foundation of, you know, what I think about basketball, and that is if you teach fundamentals, you teach kids how to do things the right way, then they'll be successful as far as playing basketball. So, you know, eventually I get back on that other level, but right now, you know, I'm enjoying the fact that I'm teaching 8th, ninth, 10th graders, and I'm able to uh, get them to understand that it's more to basketball than shooting a three-pointer. Yeah. You know, you got to understand the fundamental side of the game. So I'm in the country. I'm enjoying the country and, uh, you know, having fun. Well, be I safe. appreciate you being on, Leon. You're a great player. Thank you for what you said. And I'll look forward to, I'll see you down the line somewhere at the ball game. Thanks, Leon. Be safe Thank up you, there. Okay, okay right. guys.